Hello and welcome back to the Crime Reel. For today's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the lives of Tanya Van Kylenburg and J. Roland Cook from Canada. Tanya was born in 1969 in Victoria, British Columbia. She lived with her parents William and Jean and her brother John, along with their golden retriever Tessa. She had a happy childhood and enjoyed sailing and playing guitar. Jay, who was two years older than Tanya, was born on the 16th of December 1966. He had two sisters, Laura Lee and Kelly, and lived with them and his parents, Leona and Gordon. They lived in Saanich, British Columbia. Like Tanya, he also loved to go sailing and worked on a fishing boat as well as in a local pizza restaurant at weekends. Tanya and Jay both attended Oak Bay High School and began dating around May 1987. That summer, Tanya graduated and was taking some time out to decide upon her career path. The young couple seemed very happy together and were well liked by each other's families. On 18th of November 1987, Jay and Tanya set off on an overnight road trip to Seattle. They had borrowed Jay's father's 1977 Ford Club van and were headed to the city to collect a large parcel for Jay's father's business. Leaving Saanich, they drove south to Victoria where they boarded the MV Coho Ferry to Port Angeles, Washington. They then headed southeast on the 101 heading towards Bremerton where they planned to take another ferry to Seattle. The obvious route to take would be to leave the 101 and take the 104 to Bremerton. However, the young couple made two purchases, one in Hoodsport and the other in Alley, both of which were further south on the 101, so it is likely that they either missed the 104 exit or decided to take a longer route. Sometime after 10 that evening, they purchased their ferry tickets for the 10.35pm ferry to Seattle. They boarded the ferry with the plan to find a place to park up and spend the night in the van once arriving at the docks. They would then make the collection in Seattle the following morning before travelling back to Saanich. They were due to return home the following evening but didn't arrive. This was completely out of character for Tanya and Jay who would always call if they were going to be late. Their parents started to worry, but tried to convince themselves that perhaps the van had broken down and the couple were unable to get to a phone. However, when no contact had been made by the following morning, panic set in and Tanya and Jay were reported missing. Both families were beside themselves with worry. Their children had simply disappeared. A huge search operation was soon underway. The families even hired a plane to fly over the area where Tanya and Jay had disappeared in the hope of spotting the van. On 24th of November 1987, Tanya's family received the devastating news that her partially clothed body had been found in a ditch about an hour north of Seattle. Tanya had been restrained with plastic ties, sexually assaulted and shot in the back of the head. Suspicion immediately fell onto Jay, with investigators pursuing the theory that he was responsible for Tanya's death. Neither of the families believed this to be the case. Tanya and Jay were happy, in love, and their relationship had never shown any hints of trouble or violence. The following day, 25th of November 1987, the van was found near a Greyhound bus station in Bellingham, Washington. Inside, police found a partial palm print plastic ties identical to the ones used to restrain Tanya, plastic gloves, ammunition and Tanya's trousers which were found to have semen on them. Nearby police found Tanya's keys and purse. Just hours later, on the 26th of November 1987, some hunters came across Jay's body. It was near the Snoqualmie River, around 60 miles from where Tanya had been found. Jay had been beaten and strangled to death. Investigators now began working on the theory that Jay and Tanya had offered their attacker a lift. Jay's mum, Leona, said that her son was the sort of young man who was always ready to help anyone and would definitely pick up a stranger if they appeared to be in need. 
The police believed that the young couple had most likely met their killer on the second ferry journey. Due to the brutality of the murders, it was assumed that the killer would have a criminal past and police were hopeful that the DNA evidence found would enable them to identify the killer. Surprisingly, there was no DNA match. On December the 5th, 1987, a memorial service was held in University of Victoria's Interfaith Chapel. Meanwhile, the police continued to pursue all leads but were constantly confronted with dead ends. During the Christmas holidays that year, both Jay and Tanya's families started to receive greeting cards through the post. The cards made reference to the murders and were written to cause maximum upset to the families. They were all sent from the same person with postmarks from either New York, Los Angeles or Seattle. The police tried to locate who had sent these cards but again faced a series of dead ends. The cards continued to arrive sporadically for around a year and then suddenly stopped. Despite the best efforts of those involved, the case went cold. In 1997, Tanya's father Bill passed away without ever seeing the person responsible for his daughter's murder brought to justice. He was 61 years old. It wasn't for another 23 years, in 2010, that it seemed there would finally be a break in this case. The man who had sent the cards was identified. This man was a 78-year-old transient who had been diagnosed with several mental health issues. Upon further investigation, it was soon determined that he had nothing to do with the actual crimes. He admitted to investigators that he had been in a very dark place when he sent the cards and apologised for the distress that he had caused. Due to the statute of limitations, the man was not charged. The investigation had once again stalled. In 2018, images were released by police showing how the perpetrator may look. These images were created using speciality DNA technology known as DNA phenotyping. This method determines how a person might look from a sample of their DNA. Three images were released of the murderer at ages 25, 45 and 65. Despite receiving over a hundred new leads, the police were still no closer to catching the killer. A different approach was needed. The DNA found at the crime scene was compared to a public genealogy website. The results came back that the DNA was linked to two people on the site. From the level of matches, a genealogist determined that these people were likely to be second cousins on different sides of a family tree. When this was investigated further, it was determined that the crime scene DNA most likely belonged to a male son of William and Patricia Talbot. William and Patricia had three daughters and one son. William Earl Talbot II, a quiet 55-year-old truck driver from Washington State. At the time of the murders, William would have been 24 years old and living with his parents approximately six miles from where Jay's body had been found. William had been arrested for assault in 1984, three years before the double murder. He had completed anger management counselling for this and had not been arrested or charged with any crime since. In addition, his family have more recently described multiple incidents where he was extremely violent to them during his youth. However, the police needed conclusive proof to determine that William was definitely the killer. In order to get this, they needed a sample of William's DNA. The police began to follow William and when a coffee cup fell out of his truck, the police quickly retrieved it and tested the DNA. It matched that found at the crime scene and in May 2018, over 30 years after the crime, William was arrested and charged with the murders of Tanya and Jay. Bail was set for $2.5 million. The trial began on 11th of June 2019. William pleaded not guilty to the charges. He did not testify at his trial. The prosecution showed that the palm print in the minivan belonged to William and the DNA matched not only the semen found at the scene but also on the plastic ties used to restrain Tanya. On 28th of June 2019, William was found guilty of two counts of first degree murder. 
A month later, still protesting his innocence, William was given two life sentences without the possibility of parole. He is currently serving his sentence in Washington State Penitentiary and plans to appeal his conviction. The case took more than 30 years to solve, but Jay and Tanya's killer would finally start to pay for his crimes. The trial became the first in history where a person was successfully convicted after being linked to a crime via a genetic genealogy database. This method of policing has not been without controversy. The technology can be accessed without a warrant and used to identify people based on the participation of distant relatives in public databases. Some view this as an invasion of privacy. Whether you view this as an essential policing tool or a gross invasion of privacy is a matter of opinion. However, it is clear that its use in this specific case has enabled two grieving families to receive at least some level of much needed closure. That concludes today's story. Thanks very much for listening to that. Please leave any comments down below. As always, I'll be interested in reading them. Now it's time for petty crime. The first suspect of the day is Cookie. She is owned by the lovely Master Jeep Hightower and is two years old. Cookie's naughty trick is to take half her food behind the couch and the other half in her water. No one in the family knows why. The second criminal, in fact there's many suspects here, but it's been kindly sent in by Midji Yoon. Midji Yoon has 17 rescue cats and here are some of them. You can see Shadow Paw sat in the flower pot and Max and Dax are always together. Thanks very much for sending them in, Midgey. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. I'm not going to tell you exactly when my birthday is, but let's just say this is my birthday week. So if, like me, you're celebrating your birthday this week, then happy birthday to you. Goodbye.